death is something that touches every single human being. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 tells us, It is appointed unto man once to die. Now I understand starting off a sermon on the theme of death is a rather grim thing to do. But as I just mentioned a moment ago, death is something that touches us all. I think we'd do well for just a moment to provide a quick theology of death before we come into the passage that we're going to consider this morning from Hebrews 11. The first thing I want to say about death is death is in existence. It doesn't matter how much we busy ourselves. It doesn't matter how much we focus on the things of this world. Death exists. It is real. And the effects of it touch us all. You perhaps have known a loved one, a friend who has died, and the crushing grief that comes as a result of that. Even each and every one of us are going to experience death unless we are alive at the time of the Lord's return. The first important essential we need to recognize from Scripture regarding death is that death exists. It is real. But secondly, I want you to note that death, according to the Scripture, is an enemy. Death exists because sin exists. Death is not a natural part of the human experience. Death is an intrusion into the human life. Because sin came into the world, a consequence of sin is the reality of death. Death exists. Death is an enemy. But finally, death is an entrance. It is an entrance into the eternal state. And depending on whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, this entrance is radically different. The moment we die, there is a separation of the soul and body. And we as human beings do not cease to exist in that moment of death, but we enter into eternity. And as we enter into eternity, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you enter into the bliss of the glory of heaven, where one day you await a glorified body, where you will forever be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You will reign with him. You will be with the host of saints, and you will enjoy the blessing of the new heaven and new earth. But for those who are unbelieving, they will enter into an eternity of suffering. Eternity in the lake of fire, where God will issue his furious wrath for all eternity as a result of their rebellion against him. This is a very brief survey and summary of what Scripture teaches with regards to death. Death exists. Death is an enemy, and death is an entrance into eternity. How then should we face death as the people of God? Well, the answer is that we ought to face death with a commitment built on the foundation of faith. And that is what brings me to the passage that we're going to consider this morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at verses 20 through to 22. I would like to read these verses for you. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. What I want you to note about those three individuals who were mentioned, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, 
Each of these are mentioned in the context of death. What we have recorded in these few verses are events that took place right at the end of their lives. And as these individuals come to those last moments of their life here on earth, we see that they had their life built on the firm foundation of faith as they faced the reality of death. They were standing on the unshakable, immovable promises of God. And what I want us to be encouraged by from this message is even though we are living in a world that is passing and we will one day experience the reality of death, we can face death in a way in which we are building our lives on the foundation of faith. We don't have to bring a worldly way of thinking into our minds, and that is to suppress the reality of death, ignore the reality of death, and hold on as tightly as we can to the passing pleasures of this world. But instead, we are to submit ourselves to the sovereign hand of God, building our faith on the foundation of his promises, knowing then that we can face death with full confidence, knowing that the Lord will fulfill his promises. Now, what's going to be very interesting about this particular message is the characters that we're going to consider. You would have observed by looking at this reading or glancing down at this passage that very little is actually said about the characters of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph take up a considerable portion of Scripture. Uh, their story really begins in Genesis chapter 24 all the way through to Genesis 50. Now, that is a significant chunk of the book of Genesis. Yet they are only mentioned very briefly here. And the writer to the Hebrews highlights particular circumstances in their lives to show the importance that their lives were built on faith. Now, before we look at these characters one at a time, I want to make a few observations. The first two of the three, Isaac and Jacob, were mixed characters. What I mean by that is when you study closely the life of Isaac and of Jacob, sure, you see moments of faith, which we will talk about in just a moment, but you see a lot of failure. These probably aren't the individuals that you would automatically run to when it comes to being exemplars of faith. Now, Joseph, on the other hand, the third character, is a notable exception. He was indeed a very faithful man in the midst of trying circumstances. Yet the writer, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, groups these three together and shows that these men all built their lives on the foundation of faith, but he wants us to particularly see them in the context of their deaths. As they were nearing the end of their lives, as they had grown old and they were about to leave this world, as they were about to enter into eternity, these three men showed and displayed that their life was built on the foundation of faith. My goal in this message is to encourage you that as we live our lives, as we all will one day face the reality of death, we are called by God's grace to build our lives on the foundation of his promises. So let's begin with a, a reminder that these individuals were descendants of Abraham. You remember Abraham, we talked about him last time. His story begins in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, where God had appeared to Abraham and told him to leave his land, leave his family and friends and go to a land of God's choosing. And there God will give him the land. He will give him many descendants and his name will be blessed. Blessed. 
Well, we know that Abraham went on that journey. And as he embarked on that journey, the Lord had reiterated to Abraham on multiple occasions that he would fulfill these promises. There was one particular occasion in Genesis 15 when the Lord had reiterated to Abraham these promises. He said something that was very striking. He said to him that your descendants in the future will be wanderers in a land that is not their own. And for 400 years, they will suffer affliction. Of course, this was fulfilled later on after Joseph is in Egypt and the family of Jacob are in the land of Egypt and become slaves in Egypt. The Lord told Abraham, this is going to happen in the future. Yet despite that trial, despite that difficulty, which would last for 400 years, God is still going to be true to his promise. This is what brings us to the first character that we're going to consider in this message, and that is Isaac. Have a look again at what we see in our text, beginning in verse 20. By faith, Isaac. Now, Isaac was the son of promise for Abraham. Abraham, of course, had another child through his handmaid, Hagar, Ishmael, but Ishmael was not the son of covenant promise. Isaac was. A little bit of a background concerning Isaac. I mentioned before both Isaac and Jacob could be classed as characters who are mixed individuals. There is a, a clear sense of faithfulness in their lives, but there is a lot of failure. When it comes to Isaac, he was indeed a man of faithfulness. The faithfulness of Isaac is seen when he was a young boy. You remember in Genesis chapter 22 when God had tested Abraham and told him to take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him there on the mountain. Uh, we learn by the reading of that text that Isaac, though he was a boy, was not a little infant. He submitted himself to his father. He willingly laid himself down ready to be sacrificed. Uh, this reveals great submission and faithfulness in the life of this young man. This faithfulness was also seen later on when God had appeared to Isaac and God had spoken to him, reiterating the promise that was made to Abraham that your name will be great, I will fulfill that promise, you will be given land and there will be many descendants. We are told specifically in the text of Scripture that Isaac trusted the Lord in this. He believed that he would have descendants. Later on when he gets married, he marries a lady by the name of Rebekah and as these two come together in marriage, for 20 years, they were unable to have children. Yet we learn in Genesis 26, 25, that Isaac earnestly prayed for Rebekah. So just in those three episodes in his life, Isaac is seen as a, a faithful man, a man who submitted himself to his father, a man who trusted God that he would have descendants, and a man who earnestly prayed for his wife. So let's quickly summarize his life for just a moment before we look at what the writer to Hebrews emphasizes in his life. Isaac didn't get married until he was 40 years old. Now that is actually quite unusual in that culture at that time. But this was in accordance to God's sovereign timing and God's plan. At the age of 40, he married a wonderful woman by the name of Rebekah. You can go back to Genesis chapter 24 and learn how she was the one selected to be the bride for Isaac. And there in Genesis 24, she proves herself to be a godly, faithful woman. Well, these two come together in marital union. 
At the age of 40, Isaac is married. But as I said before, for 20 years after their marriage, Isaac and Rebekah were unable to have children. And during this time, Isaac displayed his great trust in the Lord and his love for his wife, and he prayed for her that she would conceive. And the Lord had fulfilled his promise to Abraham and also to Isaac. The Lord allowed Rebekah to conceive. Of course, she does conceive and something incredible happens. She is with child, but she discovers that she has twins. And the Lord communicates to Rebekah that these children are going to be two nations. The older will serve the younger. The Lord God had made it very clear that he is going to bypass the norms. Not everything is going to be given to the firstborn. The child of promise will actually be the younger. Well, the time came for these children to be born, and we know their names as Esau and Jacob. These children were born, and they were very different, different temperaments. Uh, We are actually told in the text that Esau was a hairy child. Uh, uh, Jacob, rather, was a smooth man. As they grow up, these temperaments are displayed in their activities. Uh, Esau was an outdoorsman. He went out hunting, and he enjoyed the life out in the open, whereas Jacob was a man who would abide in the house. He was a homebody, a very different individual. Even though we see the faithfulness of Isaac in these events, we also see his failure. The Lord God had made it very clear to his wife, Rebecca, that you are going to have these children, but the older will serve the younger. The Lord made it clear that covenant promises made to Abraham, extended to Isaac, will be carried through the younger child, and that is Jacob. Yet as these boys grow up, there is some dysfunction and division in this household. Rebecca favors Jacob, but Isaac favors Esau. And the time had come eventually when Isaac would issue the blessing. Isaac issued the blessing to Jacob who was disguised as Esau, and Isaac did that with the intention of blessing Esau. This is a failure. There is great sinfulness going on around these circumstances. That particular episode, when Isaac was old and losing his eyesight, a time when he was favoring Esau over Jacob, Great deception takes place in order for the blessing to be handed over to Jacob and not Esau. This was a moment of failure. Yet this brings me back to the text of Hebrews 11. Notice what it says. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Now, hold on for just a moment. You'll notice that text here says that Isaac did this by faith, and here he is commended. But if you go back to that episode, you will see that there was great failure in this. Yes, Isaac did issue blessings, but this was all wrong. God had made it very clear that Jacob was the child of promise, and even though he blessed Jacob, it was unintentional. So how is it then that Isaac is commended as being a man of faith? As he is in his latter years, how is he commended as a man of faith? Well, I want you to note the emphasis again of verse 20. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings. Even though Jacob was disguised as Esau and Isaac issued the blessing, the blessing of continuation of the covenant made to Abraham and to himself and now to his son. Even though this was compromised, even though this was a failure in the sense that he is not recognizing the importance of the promise being extended to Jacob, 
I want you to still see that even in that failure, he is still confident enough in the workings of God that God is going to issue future blessing to this family. So even though he is compromising in this act, he is still trusting and believing that God is going to fulfill his promise through descendants. Now, of course, we know how the story unfolds. All of a sudden, Esau comes back home and goes to his father for the blessing. And Isaac says, I thought I already gave it to you. And the unfolding of the drama begins to take place. And he says to his son Esau, I'm sorry, I've already issued the blessing. And he goes, have you got anything more for me? And then a great rage begins to take place in which Esau wants to destroy his brother Jacob. And as Jacob is sent away to marry a woman in a faraway land where his uncle Laban is, it is very interesting that there in Genesis 28, after all of this happened, Isaac did not revoke the blessing that he issued to Jacob. Even when Esau interacted with his father, he didn't revoke it. There was this sense in which he submitted to the intention and will of God. And in Genesis chapter 28, as Jacob is departing to go to a different land to get married, Isaac then speaks to Jacob. And as he speaks to Jacob, he repeats the words that God had given to Abraham and to himself, telling him that in you, the promise of God to Abraham, to Isaac, is going to be fulfilled in you, and you will have many descendants. The point here is this. Even though Isaac failed and failed badly, ultimately, he did submit himself to the will of God. He did believe that God would fulfill his promise. And the notable point being emphasized here is even in a life that fails, when we in the final analysis come to the place and recognize that God's ways are perfect and God's ways are true, and we then submit ourselves to that, we receive the applaud of heaven. That is faith. It was a weak faith. It was a wavering faith. But the chasm between weak faith and no faith is huge. And Isaac displayed faith in a mixed situation, in a compromised situation, that he believed that God would still fulfill his promise. This now brings me to the second character, and that is Jacob. Have a look at what we read in verse 21. By faith, Jacob. Now, a few words about Jacob. We pick up the story where we left off with Isaac. You remember that Jacob is now fleeing the scene. His brother wants to eliminate him. Uh, there is rage within this house. But also, he has been instructed to go marry somebody from the family of Laban, his uncle. So Jacob embarks on this journey. And along the way to his uncle Laban's land, he stops and using a rock for a pillow, sleeps. And in the midst of that particular occasion, his eyes are opened and he sees a ladder a ladder that begins on the ground and extends all the way up to heaven. And angels are coming down. Angels are going up. It's a stunning scene. And then suddenly, at the top of the ladder, he sees the Lord God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. And he speaks to Jacob. And he reminds him that the promises that I have made to Abraham and to Isaac, I am making to you. You will be given land. You will be given many descendants and your name will be blessed. Now remember the significance of this promise. 
This promise first given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 is God's solution to this fallen world. It is a reversal of the curse and it will ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God is being true to his promise. He has reaffirmed to Jacob that I am going to do what I said I would do. Well, with such an exciting event occurring, uh, Jacob continues on in his journey. And he finally arrives to his uncle Laban's land. And as he gets there, he notes that Laban had two daughters, Rachel and Leah. Leah was the older of the two. But the affection of Jacob was directed toward Rachel. He desired to marry her. So he has conversations with Laban regarding this, and the agreement is, if you work with me for seven years, you can have Rachel, you can marry her. Now, seven years certainly seems like a very long time to wait before you get to marry. But the most romantic verse in all of Scripture is found in Genesis 29, verse 20, when it says, quote, it seemed to him a few days. There he was laboring in Laban's land for seven years, but all he had to do was glance at Rachel. All he had to do was think upon her, her smile, her eyes, her appearance, her gestures, and this made that time fly. Well, the time finally arrived where the agreement was to be fulfilled. And Laban certainly gives Jacob his daughter to marry, But we learn after the first night of them coming together in the morning, he makes a surprising discovery. He learns that the lady he has married, it's not Rachel, it's Leah. Now, I don't entirely know what was going on there, whether it was a combination of the veils she was wearing, the darkness of the night beforehand. All I know is in the morning he woke up and said, well, hello, who are you? Uh, This is not the one that I intended to marry. He takes up his argument with his uncle and Laban says, well, you can marry Rachel, but you're going to have to work for me another seven years. Well, Jacob, of course, agrees to this. And in total, he works for Laban for 14 years and he is able to marry Rachel as well. Now, this is a pretty bad start to marital life. Uh, This is going to bring dysfunction. Uh, He has now got two wives, and the one he married in uh, the the order of sequence, the second one, is the wife of his great affection. Naturally, Leah is going to feel this, and you could imagine the horrible disharmony and disorder and dysfunction that's going to take place in this family. And of course, that's exactly what happens. Uh, Soon after marriage, there comes what I like to call a battle of births. It's very interesting that all of a sudden Leah conceives and she has a child. And this happens where she has four children in a row. And during this time, Rachel was unable to conceive. This is certainly a theme that runs through this family. Uh, We saw that with Abraham and Sarah. Uh, We saw this with Isaac and Rebecca. And now we're seeing this with Jacob and Rachel. Uh, Leah has had four children. Rachel has been unable to have any. So Rachel then decides to take her handmaid and send her in to Jacob. And Jacob uh, has a relations with her. And in the end, she conceives two children. Aaliyah responds and does the same with her handmaid. And she also has two children. And then after this, Aaliyah makes an arrangement where she buys the right to lay with Jacob. And she ends up having another two sons and also a daughter. This is a battle of births and this is great dysfunction. This is not good. But the time finally comes where the Lord opens up the womb of Rachel. She conceives and she gives birth to her first son. And his name was Joseph. Later on, she would have one more son. His name is Benjamin, but she would die while giving birth to him. In total, Jacob now has 12 sons. Jacob, we are told, in Hebrews 11 and verse 21, by faith, Jacob, 
when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. When you look at that life of Jacob, there was a lot of failure. There was a lot of compromise. There were sinful actions going on. There wasn't always this entrusting to the Lord. But the writer to Hebrews fast forwards all the way to the end of his life, a scene which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment, where he sees the two sons of Joseph. These sons were born in Egypt. And as he sees these sons, he places his hands on their heads and he issues blessing upon these boys. This blessing is the confidence that God will fulfill his promise through this family. By bypassing Joseph and looking at these boys is a confidence in the distant future that these children will inherit the land through their names and God will fulfill his promises. This shows that as as Jacob was nearing the end of his life, there he is leaning on his staff worshipping God, after living a life of much wavering and much failure, has confidence that God will fulfill his promise. And over in Genesis 49, he issues blessings upon all of his sons. The confidence that God will fulfill his promises, that these sons will become the tribes of the nation of Israel and God will do his work. He had faith in the promises of God. He believed that God would fulfill what he said he would do even after Jacob is gone. This now brings me to the last individual in this text, and that is Joseph. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. I want to very briefly summarize the life of Joseph before we highlight the emphasis of Hebrews 11 and verse 22. Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel, one of the sons of Jacob. And because Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife, quite naturally, Joseph, the firstborn, received great affection from Jacob. Uh, He was treated very differently to his other brothers. But God had also chosen Joseph to be a vessel that he would use for his glory. And God had granted Joseph the ability to receive dreams that were divine revelation. And in these dreams, it was displayed that a time would come in the future in which his brothers would bow down before him. Well, I don't have time to go into the full story But we know from the Genesis narrative that his brothers did not get along with him very well at all. At the age of 17, they staged a scenario in which they made it look like that he was brutally killed and devoured by a beast. They had sold him as a slave and he was then taken away to the land of Egypt. Jacob was informed by his sons that Joseph is dead. An animal had overcome him. He was brutally torn apart. During this time, Joseph, at the age of 17, is taken all the way to the land of Egypt, sold into slavery. This was all out of his hands. He had no control over these circumstances and the harshness of his brothers in this situation. Joseph was sold as a slave in Egypt, yet during this very trying and difficult time for him, God was with him. And God continued to do a work in which circumstances which were horrible, were evil, were sinful, were wicked. God was working in this so to fulfill the promise he made to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. He was promoted in Potiphar's house. Later on, a horrible event happens where Potiphar's wife accuses him of inappropriate behavior and making advances toward her, which was untrue. It was a lie. As a result of this, Joseph was thrown into prison. It's interesting that he wasn't um, 
beheaded at that particular moment, something that Potiphar would have had the right to do. Uh, This is God's preserving grace, but it may have also revealed that Potiphar saw through the situation somewhat. Uh, Joseph is then thrown into prison. And during this time, we don't know everything that is running through his mind. The Lord brings a couple of individuals into his lives, into his life who have dreams, and Joseph is able to interpret these dreams, and he asks one of them to remember me to Pharaoh when you get out. A number of years goes by, and eventually Joseph is taken out of prison. He stands before Pharaoh, and God had given Pharaoh some unsettling dreams, and Joseph was able to interpret those dreams and tell him what they meant, all by divine assistance. Well, as a result of all of this, Pharaoh was greatly impressed with Joseph and he promoted him. Joseph became the second most powerful man in in Egypt, the prime minister of Egypt. And during this time, uh, Joseph led a task force in which great preparation occurred while they had seven prosperous years, knowing that seven years of famine were coming. And they were preparing and storing and getting ready for this horrendous time in the future. The time had finally come in which famine hit the world and for seven years people were experiencing the hardships of this trying time. As a result of the famine that hit the land, the family of Jacob back in Canaan needed to get grain. So Jacob had sent his sons, with the exception of Benjamin, to go to the land of Egypt because he learnt there they have been storing up grain. He sent them to the land of Egypt to go get this grain. And you know the story. They come and they didn't recognize their brother. 20 years has passed, but Joseph recognized them. He gave them a few experiences in which he was able to test to see whether they had changed. In the end, they were required to bring their brother Benjamin to them. And after a back and forward of a very dramatic event, which you can read about all of this in the book of Genesis... Joseph reveals himself to them. He has them understand that what you did toward me was evil, but God had meant it for good. And he had meant it for good because through me, he has saved many people, including this family. Well, there was a beautiful reunion that took place Uh, Jacob was able to come from Canaan and the whole family was there. They were preserved and protected during this horrible time of famine and the family was there in Egypt. But in this whole story of Joseph, the writer to the Hebrews bypasses all those things, all the lessons that we could rightly glean from his life and he highlights this in verse 22 at the end of his life. He made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. What's going on there? What's going on is simply this. Joseph, who is the second most powerful man in Egypt, who would have had the right to a royal tomb in which he, from an earthly perspective, could have been remembered and prized for a very long time, refused burial in Egypt. He made it very clear that there will be an exodus. We are not going to stay in the land of Egypt. How did he know there was going to be an exodus? How did he know the Israelites would leave Egypt and go to the land of promise? Because he remembered the covenant and the promise that God had made to Abraham back in Genesis 15, that your descendants will be in a land that is not their own and they will suffer affliction there. But God promised Abraham that you will have the land. You will have descendants and there will be blessing. So Joseph was able to conclude that though we are here and though affliction is coming, this is not permanent. This is not our final destination. We are going to the land. So he had the people agree that when he dies, you are to take my bones and you are to take them to the land of promise. He could not see the land of promise with his own eyes. He hadn't experienced. It was hundreds of years in the future. 
But he had such confidence in the promises of God that as he faced death, he built his life on the foundation of God's promises. As I bring this to a wrap this morning, I want to emphasize for you that the life of faith views this passing life differently to the way a worldly mind thinks. A worldly mind holds on tightly to this life and to the things of this world. But the life of faith recognizes that this life is passing. And we are to face the future, building our lives on the foundation of God's promises. The life of faith views death differently. It views death as an entrance into glory where we will experience the fullness of God's promises. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph never saw the fulfillment of God's promises in their lives. But as they came to the end of their lives, they were able to trust. They were able to stand on the promises where they would not fail and fall because they knew that God's word is true. The question and challenge for all of us is this. Are you prepared to face death while standing on the promises of God? The encouragement is, though you fall and fail, God is faithful and his promises are unchanging. Stand on the promises of God. You cannot fail.